Okay, so this is uh, lecture thir 33. This is still um, sort of putting together the finite element technique and, and assembling the matrices and so forth. Uh, in the last lecture, we talked about these interpolating functions and what they look like. And uh, if you remember, um, they looked like this. Uh, they were um, these functions that basically weighted the temperatures of the nodes and uh, um, expressed how important those temperatures were as a function of position outside of the node. So they were uh, obviously one then right at the location of the node and then they would die off linearly towards zero as you moved away from the node to the um, edge of the element that contained that node. And then everywhere else in the computational domain they were zero. So these are called uh, triangular coordinates um, and you know we're going to need to know um, how to do things like integrate them and take derivatives of them in order to put together these matrices. Um, last time we said that we'll do this element by element and the reason we're doing that is because within each element we know only three of these triangular coordinates are going to be uh, active. So within this element shown here only WI, WJ, and WK are going to be active. So we need to know how to um, perform mathematical operations on the triangular coordinates <coughs> within the element. So um, again, um, this is a triangular coordinates, so we uh, need to be able to um, express what uh, W sub I, for example, is as a function of X and Y at any point inside of this element. So here's a point P, uh, and uh, you know W sub I will have some non-zero value at this point P. And actually, um, the easiest way to think about these triangular coordinates is as the ratio of two triangles. So here's uh, the basic idea. Uh, you've got uh, a triangle that's drawn between points J, K, and P, and that's this red triangle. And then, of course, the element itself is another triangle, and uh, the ratio of the red triangle to the other triangle is uh, the value of W sub I. Right? So, um, you know, based on that, you can see that W sub I has all the characteristics that we know it should have. So, for example, uh, when W sub I is, uh, when P lies on this line here that joins J and K, W sub I is going to be equal to zero because the area of that triangle would be zero. Uh, when P moves its way out here to point I, then W I will be one because now the two triangles are the same. And actually, we can think about what contours of constant W sub I must look like, right? The area of this triangle AJKP, the area of this red triangle, is one half base times height, right? So the base never changes. It's this uh, distance from J to K. The height gets bigger and bigger as you move away J, as you move away from this line JK, right? And so anywhere, for example, on this line AB that's parallel to JK the height of that triangle is going to be the same. It might be skewed left or skewed right, but the height will be the same and therefore the area will be the same. And as a result then, this line AB is a, is a line of constant W sub I, right? So these contours of constant W sub I must look like this. And they're basically um, lines that are parallel to JK and they just um, are uh, basically um, related to how far away you are from that line JK moving towards uh, point I. Right? So point two five here is a line that's uh, one quarter of the way from uh, you know from this line to the to the top. Point five, you're half the way. Point seven five, and then finally uh, one gets you all the way there. So based on that, then I can figure out an equation for what. Um, W sub I is, right, it's not necessarily easy, but certainly doable to calculate uh, given the coordinates of points I, J, and K, and the coordinate of point P, which is X, Y, it's easy to calculate the uh, area of A, J, K, P, and the area of the entire element, and the ratio of those two areas, uh, that, is, that is the value of W sub I. So we have now an understanding of what the equation for W sub I sub B. Um, we won't go through deriving that here um, just because it's kind of tedious and not intellectually that challenging. Um, but here's the final equation that you get. Um, 
So the uh, formula is a function, obviously, of x and y. Um, so where you are inside of this element. It's also a formula of uh, some other parameters, all of which themselves are functions of the coordinates of the node. So xi, yi, and so on. Um, so you can see uh, these coordinates, x, j, y, k, and so forth. There's also, in this case, a y, j, k, and an x, j, k. And that's just shorthand for the difference between y sub k and y sub j. So you can see y, j, k uh, here is y, k minus y, j. x, j, k is x, k minus x, j. And then finally, there's this parameter b, i, j, k. And uh, b, i, j, k is defined here in terms of things we've already seen, x, i, j, y, j, k, and so on. The parameter b, i, j, k is related to the area of the element. And you can see that here. Um, the, the area of the element is the absolute value of b, i, j, k divided by 2. Um, if the nodes are defined in this counterclockwise manner, so for example here we have i and then j and then k counterclockwise, then b, i, j, k is guaranteed to be greater than 0 and the area of the element is just b, i, j, k divided by 2. So most meshing software will define your nodes in, in that counterclockwise manner for you. Um, we're going to need to take the derivative of this function and we're also going to need to integrate it. So taking the derivative is uh, pretty easy. So here if I want to take uh, the derivative of wi with respect to x, um, I just get uh, what, minus yjk over bijk. Derivative with respect to y um, is here. If we did the same thing for the other uh, interpolating functions, so wj and w, wk, you'd get uh, these formulas here. And then we're going to need to integrate them over the element. And here's the general formula for doing that. If you integrate um, wi uh, to the a power times wj to the b power times wk to the c power, uh, you get this uh, formula here. So a factorial, b factorial, c factorial, and then in the denominator a plus b plus c plus 2 factorial, and then multiply that all by 2 times a. So with, with all that done then, uh, we're ready to start uh, assembling the um, the element capacitance matrix and, and the element conductance matrix and so on. So let's um, remember what our system of equations looks like and, and what the integrations we're trying to do are. So here's the whole system of equations expressed in terms of an area integral over the entire computational domain. Um, this C then is our global capacitance matrix. Uh, we said that we were going to try to put this C together one element at a time. So we're doing this area integral but we're doing it element by element. And the, the area integral done over one element is referred to as the elements capacitance ratio, uh, capacitance matrix. And that's what we have to figure out uh, how to put together. So um, here's the element capacitance matrix. Um, let's start with the basic form of it. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is pull out the density and the, and the heat capacity uh, from the integral. So what that really means is we might allow density or heat capacity to vary in the computational domain. Uh, but we're not going to allow it to vary within one element. Within one element, it'll be constant. So we can pull it out of our area integral, and that leaves us with W times W transpose. And uh, that, that matrix uh, evaluated, but only in the element. So W and W transpose are both going to be um, vectors. So W is a, uh, a column vector, and W transpose is a row vector. And these are the vectors of our interpolating functions, right? And within the element, there's only three of them that aren't zero. So wi, wj, and wk. So when I multiply the, the column vector w by the row vector w transpose, there's going to be nine non-zero elements, right? And those are shown here. There's going to be um, three elements in row i, and those are going to happen in columns i, j, and k. And there's going to be three elements in row j, and three elements in row k. So if you do the multiplication, you'll see in row i, column i, so this is uh, element i, i, you'll get uh, w i squared integrated over the area of the element. And then in column j, you'll get w i, w j. In column k, it'll be w i, w k. And you can do that for, for all of those. 
So these are integrals we know how to do. Right here's our general formula for how you integrate uh, the product of interpolating functions. Um, so wi squared is the particular case where a is equal to 2 and then b and c are 0. And uh, wj squared and wk squared are the same. Uh, and if you go through the math uh, of that, you'll find that that integral is uh, the area of the element divided by 6. So each of these um, diagonal elements are the area of the element divided by 6. And then if you start looking at the off-diagonal elements, so here's wi, wj, um, this is the case where a is 1 and b is 1 and c is 0. And so that's also true for all the off-diagonal elements, so all six of those. And if you plug that into this equation, you'll get that that's the area of the element uh, divided by 12. So pulling the area of the element divided by 12 out, um, you'll see this is our element capacitance ratio, right? We have the density and specific heat capacity in the, air, air, in the element uh, multiplied by the area of the element divided by 12. And then you have twos along the main diagonal and then one in the off diagonal elements. And again, there's only nine non-zero elements in this otherwise potentially massive array of uh, a, a massive matrix. Um, so we know how to do that. And once, we, once we've done that, of course, uh, it's relatively easy to add up all these element matrices together, uh, one element at a time, and get to uh, our global capacitance matrix. A um, couple things to notice here. One is that the capacitance matrix is symmetric, right? So uh, IJ and JI, IK and KI, they have to be the same. Um, but it's not diagonal in the way that it was for a finite difference uh, approach. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that when you go through uh, element by element, you're not simply filling in uh, row by row uh, of the global capacitance matrix in the way that you were with a finite difference uh, approach. So in a finite difference approach, every row corresponded to a certain control volume, and, and, and filling them in then was just going row by row. Right here, every element does not correspond to a given row in this matrix. The elements can correspond, can, can have uh, nodes that, that then span several rows, so three different rows actually, right? So the point is is that you um, are, are filling in um, multiple rows as you move through the elements. And, and what that really means is you have to be very careful not to overwrite an existing entry if you come back to it when you're filling in a different element, right? Um, I guess the last note here is that if you look at the sum of all the elements, um, you have 12, so 12 over 12 is 1, and basically you just get the, the capacitance of the, of the element, right? So the sum of all the entries here is the capacitance of that element. And you can see that one way of thinking about this is that you get um, one-third of the capacitance assigned to row I, one-third to row J, and one-third to row K. So you're sort of taking... Uh, one third of this element's capacitance and, and lumping it in with node i and, and so forth. So we can do the same kind of process with the conductance matrix. So here we're taking these conduction terms. Um, we're pulling out the area integral over the entire computational domain. And again, we're going to do these one element at a time, right? So we're splitting this into a whole bunch of area integrals over the individual elements, and those are our element conductance matrices. So this is the thing we need to know how to, how to build uh, within each element. Um, so here, here it is again. Um, uh, once again, we're going to be able to pull out the conductivity and say that while it may vary over the computational domain, we're not going to let it vary over each element. And uh, here we have uh, um, a W and a W transpose in which there's only three active interpolating functions. So it becomes a little easier to think about it inside of the element. So let's just think about the DW DX terms uh, and realize that the DW DY terms are basically the same thing. Uh, so if I just look at the DW DX terms here, um, this is the nine non-zero element terms that I get in my element conductance matrix, right? So along the main diagonal, I have uh, the partial derivative squared, right? So here I'm going to have dw di, sorry, is it dw i dx times dw i dx. If I move over one column, I'll have dw i dx times dw j dx, and so forth. 
uh, moving over to column K. And, and that sort of just uh, populates this uh, matrix. Um, we need to then uh, remember how to take derivatives of these interpolating functions. Um, one thing to realize is that within each element, these derivatives are, are constant, right? They don't change with position inside an element. That is the definition of a linear function. It's like a pane of glass. So that means I can pull them out of the area integrals as I've done here. And I'm left with just the integral of uh, the differential of area over the area, which of course is just the area. So I can rewrite it as I've, as I've done here. And now I just have a bunch of... Um, derivatives that are constant that I have to evaluate and, and multiply together. Uh, so here again are f formulas for how you calculate the derivatives of the interpolating functions. Right? So I can just basically plug these uh, into this matrix and I get this. And again, remember this is only the, the, the dw dx part of this element conductance matrix. I have to do exactly the same thing for the dw dy part, which would give me uh, nine more terms that have to be added to these nine terms. Um, when you get done doing that, this is uh, what you end up with, right? You have uh, the, the conductivity in the element, the area of the element, and then you have these um, kappa uh, terms, ii, ij, ik, and so on. And, and you can evaluate them as shown over here. Um, you know, there's nine of them. Um, really, there's um, only six of them that you have to calculate uniquely because the the, con the conductance matrix is also symmetric so kappa i j and kappa j i are going to be the same and so forth um, these are really just formulas that once you know how to do them it's very easy to program them you know you, they only depend on the coordinates of the nodes that make up the element um, again it's worth remembering that as you build your conductance matrix element by element so you'll be adding these together and adding basically adding terms to the global conductance matrix you have to recognize that uh, when you're when you're putting a term into row i and column j is very likely that there's already a term there that has been added from a previous element so don't overwrite that term make sure you add the term you're you're adding to the element to whatever's already in there so that's um, the capacitance and the conductance matrix and the next uh, lecture we'll talk about doing the generation vector and then we'll also talk about how you move along the boundaries to do those boundary integrals and at that point we'll be ready to actually uh, do the finite element technique for a, for a real problem.